Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I'm thrilled to have you here. Um, welcome to our midday session for Processing Community Day Pittsburgh. Uh, my name is Golan Levin. I'm director of the Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry, and in partnership with uh, the Pitt Department of Fine Arts and uh, the Pitt Library of Fine Arts, uh, we are uh, pleased to co-present um, Pittsburgh's Processing Community Day. And this is the fun uh, free lunch and speed sessions, uh, or lightning talks, uh, in which people from the community have uh, kindly volunteered to talk about uh, their work. Uh, we have presenters from Carnegie Mellon, from Pitt, uh, from Youngtown, Youngstown State University, and all the way from MIT. Uh, so four different places represented uh, a wide range of, of folks uh, who come into town or, or who are already in town who are going to present. Um, all the talks will be six minutes long. Yeah. Um, <laughs> This is the weak version of the, of the device. The strong version is the signal guillotine that actually cuts you off. Um, I don't have that right with me, but um, someday. Uh, hopefully we don't need it today. Um, uh, and so just to say, we have uh, about 10, I think, presentations. Um, and uh, the order that you see there is not the order uh, that they're in. Uh, we've done a little bit of uh, creative scrambling. And uh, I'm going to just kind of introduce each person briefly with a biography, and then uh, a brief bio, and then they'll take it away. Uh, Rosa, would you? Um, Want to come on, come on up and uh, get yourself uh, ready to go. Uh, this machine will hopefully beep at the end of your six minutes. Uh, Rosa Kurtz will be speaking about Arduino for small-scale kinetic sculpture. Rosa is a BXA student studying physics and art. It's a hybrid inter interdisciplinary degree we have here at Carnegie Mellon. She's interested in movement and interactive-based artwork in the form of animation, games, and electronics. And she hopes to pursue a career in game design, animation, or engineering. So, Rosa. Take it away. OK. Uh, so here's my project. Um, and I'm going to hopefully show you just 30 seconds of this so you know what I'm talking about. So this is Herman, um, my small scale kinetic sculpture. Um, and when I go to make an Arduino project, I start off with an initial sketch of what I want. Um, and that's like the goal. I want this at the end. Then I break it down into the individual systems I want to design. So for this particular project, I wanted to create the eyes, the wing. Um, there was a goal of a tail at some point. Obviously, it didn't happen. Um, part of the thing you want to do is you break it down into what do I need to do and what do I want to do. Uh, I use Arduino. The driving force of this project is servos. Uh, this is my eye and blink system. Um, using uh, two servos, one for the eyelids, one for the eyes. This is my wing component. Um, and there is only one servo controlling the wing. Um, the biggest um, issue with this project in particular was that I wanted to use batteries, and I didn't want the batteries or any of the circuitry to be visible. And if you've ever worked with Arduino, you know as soon as you plug in a wire, there is an issue for it to go wrong. And each wire you add exponentially increases the chance of things going wrong. So you need to be able to get your fingers in there halfway through the project, right before you're using it, to be able to rework it and try to get it to work. Um, so that was the hardest part, and that's what I started with. Um, for this project, um, I created the body with my battery case. And I started with just like a hinge joint. I can show it. So it opens up. You can take the batteries out, and then you slot them in. Um, because I worry, I wanted 16 batteries um, to make sure it would last for a long period of time without me needing to change it. Um, and after that, uh, I fit the head. Um, and all the servo components into the Arduino, and then you slot it inside, just like that. And then you can fit it back together. Uh, materials that I find helpful, little pieces of wood, um, pins, needles, string, fishing line, glue, X-Acto knife, drill bits. Um, not necessarily with the drill. Uh, you can just use your fingers. Uh, cuts your fingers up a bit, but it's fine. Um, <laughs> and screwdrivers, tiny screws in bulk. 
um, any materials you find in the CFA dumpsters. Um, Goodwill, I like Goodwill, um, and Creative Reuse provided most of the pieces um, for the body. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. <clears throat> um, next up is Dana Sperry. Uh, Dana is currently living in Pittsburgh. He's an associate professor of digital media at the Department of Art at Youngstown State University. Um, his work has been exhibited uh, and widely inc including screenings in France, Russia, Brazil, and Spain. Uh, we'll give Dana a moment to configurate himself here. Wonderful. You ready? Yeah. Take it away, Dana. Okay, so I have a, a good friend who, he's a painter, and he would, for actually about six, seven years ago, started asking me to make animations with, he would send a data set in very tight constraints, and this is actually a still from one of those animations. This is the George W. Bush years, the changes in the um, Dow Jones Industrial Average, and you can see the crash. Um, and then about a year ago, he sent me four data sets without any constraints whatsoever, and there's no show, there was nothing, he just said, make something and sent me these data sets. And so then, all of a sudden, I'd realized how I thought about these data sets. Um, I made an artificial time constraint and then added one more data point. And then I made this. Because what I realized is that my thought about the data was that I didn't want to tell a story about the data. What I wanted to talk about, the fact is that this data scares the crap out of me. I'm old enough that I'm thinking about retirement. I'm supposed to make decisions about my financial future, and I know nothing. And I'm supposed to be predicting, and it scares me. So this is not about the data, it's about how scared I am of this data. And it's a human-made data force that I'm supposed to act like there's a predictive future, but there isn't. And the more I know, I really don't know anything at all. So that's really what I wanted to say, and that's sort of what I hope it's kind of saying. Um, anyways, it's actually quite simple to make, so I just want to go to mechanics just a bit. It's actually only two images and a simple mask. The mask is actually super simple. It's just made with a P-shape. And just X1 and X2 are the data sets on two different days. That's it. So it's super easy and simple to make. So that's sort of a sample of what the mask looks like. And yeah, and that's it. And apparently, um, this is kind of a one-off for me, but it's done really well. And actually, I just got an email this morning that's going to show in Italy. So apparently, other people are freaked out as much as I am. Thank you. Uh. Wow. These are these are really speed presentations. <laughs> Thanks, Dana. All right. Uh, well, uh, next up is Chloe Desol. I am thrilled to introduce Chloe Desol, uh, who will be speaking about the tale of the Brooklyn pastrami. Actually, it's the Brooklyn pastram. Pastram. <laughs> I. You know what, I, I figured that had to be a typo. <laughs> nope. My mistake, I am so sorry. I don't know what a pastrum is. Uh, Chloe is a Pittsburgh-based, Franco-German raised researcher and computational artist. She works at the intersection of filmmaking, media design, and neuroscience, often merging disciplines through curious inquiry. Her work largely deals with cognition, memory, and family heritage as seen through time-based narratives. She will soon be graduating uh, with a Bachelor's of Cognitive Neuroscience and Fine Arts from Carnegie Mellon. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Chloe DeSoul. Um, I am a student here at Carnegie Mellon in my last year, um, and I'm about to graduate with a Bachelor of Neuroscience and Fine Arts. Um, yeah, so to give you a bit of background on, on like my whole thing, um, I'm a computational artist mainly, uh, also somewhat a filmmaker, and but I also have a lot of experience with neuroscience research. So these are two pap these are two papers that I recently wrote. Um, one about the effects of gendered emotion suppression on memory, and the other on the autism spectrum disorder in relation to storytelling. So that's kind of important because a lot of my work is neuroscience based, uh, for better or for worse mainly worse when I'm in a conceptual art school. Uh, <laughs> not, no comment on that. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple projects that I worked on that can give you some context on how I work. I mainly work through exploration and research. So this is um, the weird setup that I have on my head is a LiDAR scanner set up on a rotational rig driven by an Arduino, which I got a lot of help from Ben Snell with. Um, and so I basically just went into a public bus 
um, in Pittsburgh and was scanning the insides uh, of the bus. And I had like this huge, like eight pound battery in my backpack with a ton of wires coming out and the LIDAR on my head and a, some confusing code on my laptop. So I was a bit nervous that people would give me uh, issues, but I didn't really get much more than this kind of look. Um, one more. <laughs> and weirdly enough, a lot of people thought that I worked for Uber. I, I was carrying around a clipboard to seem more official, and, I had, and it said Carnegie Mellon Engineering on my hard hat. So for some reason, they thought that Uber was also scanning the insides of public transportation now. Uh, so this is the kind of image that it produces. This is just a GIF of the a four minute video, which is also overlaid with um, binaural audio from inside of the buses. Um, so it's, it's pretty techy and pretty researchy, but um, that's one of those. And another one that I wanted to bring, bring up is a research project that I did in conjunction with Faith Kim from the School of Design. Uh, and we were basically researching for about a month how AR could potentially be used for film. Um, and one of the main issues that we had was that AR targets are really invasive and removed from the experience, and the, other, the only other option at the time was um, ground detection. So we were basically trying to find a way to create AR targets by using uh, cinematography and composition. Um, and so the idea was that, in theory, uh, it could be used to create or actually show a separate storyline or a parallel storyline, or maybe potentially um, give clues as to what might happen in the story. Um, so it's some sort of interactive experience. But mainly these two projects I wanted to talk to you about because I'm working on my thesis project right now, uh, which is a documentary. And this is my grandfather. He, um, this is when he was about 30 or so, or 28, I think exactly. Um, and he's one of, mo one of the most smart, uh, intelligent and, um, he's one of the most intelligent people I know. And he's so intelligent that he you can tell in a crowd. Um, he's also an amazing storyteller. And he, it, he grew up uh, from a, in a very poor immigrant family he, who fled anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe in Brooklyn. And uh, he somehow made it to be a, a pretty good doctor and was actually President Nixon's doctor uh, on Andrews Air Force Base. And he heard a lot of really crazy stories while he was there. One of them being that um, uh, Che Guevara's murder was American orchestrated, uh, which is a bit hush-hush apparently, but that's one of my favorite stories of his. And he's an, he's an incredible storyteller, and he, he drags the stories way into the long side. Um, this is the kind of emails I get from him. It's about two or three a day. He loves telling stories and sending me a lot of stuff. Um, and so a couple years ago, he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Um, and so it, for people who don't know, that's a degenerative memory, um, brain disorder. And he's, he's a bit of a weird case where he's actually pretty okay by now, but it's mainly motor functions and also cognition by the end of it. Uh, so I started, I, I was always very interested in memory, so I started doing work around, um, I started doing work around uh, uh, documentary photography and, and documenting people who were going through the, the process of uh, losing their memory. And so this is one of the photographs that I've taken. And so I'm working on this documentary, but I wasn't quite sure how I wanted to format it yet um, until I interviewed my grandfather and heard this story for the gazillionth time. And suddenly, I had no idea what hit me. My brain started churning, and I said to him, well, it comes from a pastrom. He says, what's a pastrom? I said, oh, only pastroms live in New York City. He says, what do you mean? How do they live here? He says, well, you see all the sewers we have? They live in the sewers, and at night, they come out, and they roam the city, and they go back, and they have three legs. It's bizarre, because they're, they're mutants from living in the sewers, and the dirt, and all the terrible chemicals in there. And so it's only unique to New York City. So that's uh, one of his favorite stories, where he told someone who wasn't from New York City that pastrami came from a pastrum. Uh, and apparently, the, this grown man still believes that pastrums live in the sewers of New York City. Um, and so basically this really made me think of how I wanted to tell the story of progressive memory loss uh, and I didn't want it to be linear and I didn't want it to be sad. So I'm basically giving, telling stories that people have self-selected, so self-selected memory. Um, and I'm using depth kit, which I think is, um, is a good way of, ah, um, is a good way of representing memory loss. And um, anyways, I'll leave you with this quote, which is mainly why I'm doing it 
it's based off of neuroscientific research that strengthening strengthening of neural neural pathways actually improves memory and prevents it from fading. Anyways, sorry for the overtime. Thank you. Next up is Gray Crawford. Um, give us a moment to get our laptops switched out. Uh, Gray will be speaking about embodied familiarity with novel physics. Gray is a spatial interface designer, digital artist and musician, and CMU uh, graduate student uh, researching embodiment and intuition within spatial computing, having previously developed augmented reality hand interfaces at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Let me just delete that slide. You good? Oh, yeah. Right on. And Gray Crawford. Hi. So I have been working on my master's thesis for the past semester and a month-ish. And um, I'm especially interested in virtual reality and spatial interfaces. Um, I think that they offer a really interesting, uh, many interesting opportunities because they're the first time that we can really um, experience new, in, new entire environments and sets of physics that we haven't really been able to like, be present in in, as, in a spatial manner with our bodies. Um, like we are born into this world, we, we're provided a certain physiology, the physics of the universe happen to be the way that they are right now, and we get really good at maneuvering ourselves through the world. We can develop all these intuitions about how to like balance objects and like how to maneuver ourselves through the world, and, and um, that's like a, a really core aspect of what it means to be a human being with a body. Um, and I think that a lot of that is lost when so much of our interaction with technology is constrained to the two-dimensional screens and um, or like very very limited input methods like buttons and joysticks etc um, and I, I think that we can also develop intuitions through like repeated engagement with those spaces the, the more two-dimensional uh, screen based ones um, but they still don't really fully engage all, all of our like embodied um, like the, the possibilities of the fluency that we can develop that's why I think VR and spatial interfaces are especially interesting because since they're being simulated inside of a computer, you can simulate any arbitrary physics system that you want. And that's, that offers like this massive space of possible design and, and possible experience where we can put ourselves into these environments where we've had no previous exposure to it. And um, I think that the challenge there is that you could put yourself in, into, into some environment that's so distant from the physics that we are normally uh, like used to that there, there'd be no grounding and you would, like, I would fear that, that you would not be able to develop any intuition. And so I, one of the things that I've been hoping to explore in my, in my thesis is like, if, if I put myself, or if I put the human in, into some like, novel, novel physics set, like, is it possible to, to develop intuitions for that, the, 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 spe the specifics of um, that set of physics? Um, and I, I started thinking about, about like, how, how physics is, uh, or, like, like the, the set of all possible physics that could exist, and the physics of this universe happens to be only one little point in that whole parameter space of all possible um, uh, parameters, et cetera. Um, and so I'll just start showing you some of the things that I've been working on. Um, this was uh, using the ray marching toolkit, which is a, um, a, a method of r rendering materials. It's not based on polygons. It's, uh, it, it's this weird geometric method or, of like constructing these ISO surfaces around these um, uh, more like mathematical definitions of objects. And I was especially interested in how the um, the materials can sort of be like fused and blend together as they become um, closer in, in contact. Um, I'm, I'm sure you all have the experience of when you're like holding a tool um, and it feels like an extension of yourself or like you, like you might be using a pencil and you feel the contact at the, t at the tip of the pencil even though what you're literally sensing is like these lateral forces on your fingers or um, and you, you, can, you can do the same thing when you're like dri driving a car. You feel the road, even though you're just it's being mediated through the, the structure of the car. And um, I'm especially interested in how that that sort of like like repeated engagement with an object can sort of allow you to it, it to like fuse with you in a way. And I, I think that this method of rendering is especially interesting and like really uh, like 
satisfyingly compelling in, in how if once you grab an object, you're, you're visually fusing with it too. And I was interested in how that sort of visual fusing could mirror the, the, like, the, the subjective sensation of like this fusion with a tool. Um, and then on the right, I was hoping to take that further with like incorporating user interface elements into the body. Um, obviously, this, that sphere doesn't really do anything, but um, I'm interested in, in how we might be able to blur the line as to what the body is and what the user interface is. So it's not these, like, these separate interface panels and then your body. And um, I, I'm interested in the idea that it might be incorporated I into yourself. Um, this is another, another physics engine that I was using. This is NVIDIA Flex. Um, and I was especially interested, um, whereas this one had no real like physical dynamics, it was mostly like a rendering method. I see that, I'll fast forward. So um, <laughs> uh, like, I, I was interested in, in, in how these like super responsive, um, large scale par particle systems could um, allow me to develop. Um, I, I, I mostly just wanted to throw myself into some like, uh, Rather, I'll, I'll say that about this one. So th this is a, sorry, this is an, an, another very large particle system using uh, Unity's visual effect graph. And what was interesting about this is I was like hoping to just like completely not represent the body at all and see if I could map like certain parameters of like the rotation of my wrist in, uh, in, in, in different directions to like arbitrary parameters of how, how much these like force fields were affecting these, these particles. And I wanted to see like how quickly if I threw myself into this environment, how quickly I could develop an intuition for like uh, shepherding these particles and their behavior. Um, and it turned out it did not take very long at all. And so I hope that this can, show that, that we can trust people to um, develop intuitions if you're thrown into an environment, you can, through repeated engagement, actually uh, develop those, those uh, understandings. Cool, thanks. Beautiful stuff, Gray, thanks. <laughs> thanks, next up is Connie Yi. Connie is a sophomore at Carnegie Mellon University in the Bachelor of Computer Science and Arts program, a hybrid interdisciplinary degree program. She likes cute monsters and alternative realities. At school, she's excited to be exploring human-computer interaction, machine learning, and immersive technologies. Take it away, Connie. Okay, hi guys. So I'm gonna be talking about a project I did last semester. Um, it's not actually called Meet Magic. I, I just like the phrase. Um, so I made a Unity and Arduino version of the game Cooking Mama. Um, if you don't know what it is, it's this Nintendo game that I played a lot when I was younger. But basically you just make dishes and either Mama's like very pleased with how you made it or she's very mad with how you made it. Um, and then basically you just like define your self-worth on how you cook to the recipe. <laughs> um, so. When I was um, thinking about what I could make as a Unity and Arduino project, um, I really wanted to leverage the advantages of like both Unity and Arduino. Um, and I thought, hey, cooking mama. So what I did was I made um, two felt fabric controllers. One was um, spam and one was a steak, which you'll see in a second. Um, and I, I put sensors in them so you could sense like when you were chopping the steak or if like the spam was inside of the can or outside of the can. Um, oh, sorry. How do I? Yeah, so like um, <laughs> it, it actually ended up being very popular on Twitter, um, which was very surprising for me. But Half a million views. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so as you can see, um, this there's a knife here. Um, it's just a felt knife. It's nothing special. Um, and then inside of the steak, there's six buttons. I linked you a diagram that you can see later. And um, I couldn't figure out how to get the Bluetooth part to work because I think I had to like pay for that Unity plugin. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Um, so, I guess I'll just talk faster. <laughs> so, um, you can see I'm like obscuring the wires with fabric, um, and then someone called it like an umbilical cord on Twitter, <laughs> but it's fine. <laughs> um, and 
so you can see that when you you hit the spot on the stake it um, sends like which button is being pressed to the Arduino and then the Arduino through the serial port just like prints like some encoded data and then I read that in Unity um, and then Unity knows what button's being pressed so I can like appropriately slice the stake at the correct position. So um, here's just like more, more documentation on it. Um, I think it like looks cooler as a six second clip, but you can see the rest anyways. Ah, how do I full screen this? Whatever. <laughs> yeah, so there's two levels. The first one is um, the stake, which I kind of described earlier. Um, yeah, you can like kind of see what's happening back here. And then when she's satisfied with your performance on the stake, you like you put the spam into the bowl and you made a meat salad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I didn't get to this part, but ideally it would have displayed like a different numeric value for like how well you did. So if you like hit the wrong part of the stake, um, then you would have done poorly. Or if you spent too long taking the spam and putting it into the bowl, um, you also would have done poorly. But like right now, everyone gets 100. <laughs> yeah, so like if you're accurate when you're cutting, um, mama's like very pleased. If like you do a kind of bad job, but like you redeem yourself at the end, you get a good. And then if you do like a terrible, terrible job, um, she, she she like has fire in her eyes and gets mad at you. <laughs> um, yeah, so, oh shoot, okay, a little more about how I made it. So you can see like this is a diagram. So um, this is the stake and there's like a breadboard that I put inside and there's six buttons, one for each section of the stake that you might be hitting. Um, on top of the button, I overlaid like acrylic boards that I cut just so it could have like a greater range of influence. Um, yeah, it's pretty simple. And then based like these buttons are all attached to an Arduino. Um, so is the spam. So the spam works with photocells. So like based on the change in light, you can tell if like the meat is inside the can or not. Um, so all of this information is just like encoded into zeros and ones. Um, like I think it's a one if the button's being pressed, um, and like a zero if not. And then it's sent to Unity, um, where there's just like a simple C sharp script to handle like the the cooking mama part of it. Um, that's yeah. <laughs> That's basically it. I'm actually more of like a I don't usually work with Arduino. Um so I think this project is like a pretty good example of how if you want to get started with Arduino, um it's actually pretty easy. I highly recommend Sydney Church's class if you haven't taken it. Also thank you Sydney for the Arduino help. I don't think he's here. Um, <laughs> but but yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Connie. And next up is Gabe Fields. While well, Gabe's getting set up. Gabe um, uh, is going to present a, a talk entitled A Romance with Reality, asterisk. Gabe. Oh, what's the asterisk about? Yeah, I don't know. You put the asterisk there. I'm just reading what I'm right, what it says in the paper. Gabe, a culturally Jewish New Yorker and an admirer of both squids and fire, is currently a possibly graduating senior at MIT with interests in computer science, art, and interaction design. He has interned at companies like Google and Magic Leap as a user experience prototyper for virtual augmented reality, worked on a fabric 3D printing experiment at Nervous System Design Studio, and has conducted undergraduate research at MIT Media Lab. When he's not sleeping or eating, he also enjoys blowing glass and cooking food to eat before sleeping. Uh, side note, he lives in my old house at MIT. Uh, <laughs> Hello. Hey. Hi, Gabe. Take it away. Okay. What's the asterisk about? Um, so in terms of reality, I'm just going to be talking about this right now. Maybe there's like another level that's, that's like more fundamental, but, but I'm just going to talk about this one. Um, so, oh wait, let me bring my notes up. Okay. So back in high school, I used to play a lot of video games. 
I would escape into it for comfort, for procrastination, and to be by myself without feeling like I was alone. Um, so when I ended up at MIT as an overwhelmed first semester freshman, and I had the opportunity to try out the like a brand new virtual reality system, I had never seen anything like it. I had floating hands in space in front of me. It was crazy. It was like I could insert myself into a computer. And there was a certain kind of escapist wish fulfillment there, um, like an idea that you could experience anything. Um, and so over the next couple of years, I took every chance that I could to work with these kinds of technologies. Um, this was a project that I did at the Media Lab for like visualizing electromagnetics, where you can make charges all around you. Um, but the main thing that I feel like I found when I was, is that when you spend too much time in virtual reality, and then you come out of it, you start to realize these really stupidly obvious things about the actual world um, from like an interaction perspective that, that everyone else probably already knows, but you think they're really profound. Um, <laughs> and so let's just, let's like do a demo of this. Um, you can look anywhere. 360. 360 degrees, I can translate my body, and then I have a 360 degree view from wherever I, I go. And then I have we full haptic feedback all over our bodies. You can like stroke yourself. You can grab things. You can squeeze them. You can smell them. You can lick them. And you can look really close, and it gets even more detailed the closer you look. It's crazy. I can throw it to you. Um, and that's the other thing is that we're all in this together, and any number of us can gather in the same space at the same time. And I can look at you with my eyes and I can communicate and I can touch you. Not, I'm not gonna touch you, but. <laughs> so that's crazy and I was. <laughs> and so when I realized that, I, I started wanting to, to focus more on, on, on kind of engaging with that idea. Um, I think I had had this idea that I always wanted to work in like the coolest, most advanced, slickest medium that there was. Um, and I think at MIT it's really easy to have that idea like enabled just by like everybody wanting to do technology. Um, but I started wanting to focus more on how the things that I make engage with people and less on like the evangelization part of that. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few projects that I've done in the last year or so. Um, oh yeah, also it's free. <laughs> so that's pretty great. Um, so this is a project called The Surrogate um, that I did for an artistic experimentation class. Um, so it's imagining a world where everybody lives in, like, in a virtual embedded system, and, but similar to a lot of like, mindfulness movements that are happening right now in reaction to technology, in, in this imagined bizarre future there's this uh, desire to escape the, the constant repetitive stimulus and maybe there's like this is uh, this this artifact that's made by someone maybe trying to just sell stuff to people um, that, that, that like, you know, you can get out and it's magical and you'll be a better person. And so it's got a uh, welding glass in front of your eyes so you can only see the sun and really bright lights um, and, and tubes so that all of the sound gets really distorted. Um, and that was really fun. And then I did a whole performance as like this salesman um, trying to convince people that they shouldn't be in the world that they're in. Um, here's another project. This was called Eat. Um, this was made with the Hollow Earth Collective, which is Jabari over there, and Caroline Hermans, and uh, Hisham Bedri, and Wiley Corning. So the idea is that this is it's a virtual grape-eating experience. Um, <laughs> And we wanted to kind of break that wall that exists between like, the virtual world and the real world um, by, by giving you a grape to eat. And it's attached to a virtual reality controller, but it's actually um, a little bit to the side of where it really is in real life. And so you think that you know where it is, and you try to put it in your mouth, and you hit yourself in the face. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was really effective. Um, there's something really powerful about that sense of, I know where this is, I can see it with my hands, and then the real physical world is not, not agreeing with that. Um, <laughs> uh, so here's one more. This is the most recent project that I did um, for a vision in art and neuroscience class. Um, it's called, the name is the, it's the emoji without a face. Um, 
And basically, I wanted to make two faces dance with each other in a way. Um, it's a booth. Two people sit down at a cross from each other, and you put your head on a chin rest. Um, you make eye contact with the other person. And then there's LEDs around your face and, and a half-silvered mirror in the middle um, so that your faces get mixed together. Um, and so I kind of wanted to have something a little bit intimate, a little bit playful, um, but kind of surreal. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Thank you, Gabe. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming all the way down from Boston um, to join us here. Uh, next up is Josh Carey. Josh, where you at? Hey, Josh. Very good. After Josh, just as a recap, will be Ling Dong, Sam, and Jocelyn. Oh, fantastic. Josh Carey is going to be talking about something called Finding Generative Poems. Uh, Josh is an artist and a student here at Carnegie Mellon's BFA program, working mostly in sculpture and video. Right now, he's interested in the relationship between family members and between individuals and the home, and in how we construct narratives for these relationships and for events around them through their surviving artifacts. His recent work has involved live drawings over video chat, replicating old Japanese postcards, and a bit to the side of all this, making hypothetical musical instruments. With media art, he's investigating how to piece together personally and historically meaningful chunks from fragments, documents, and images that we find online or that we digitize through our mobile devices. Joshua Carey. Hi guys, I'm Josh. Um, this is my app called Word Hunt or Word Search. Uh, I will play this video. Um, it has only one sound, so. Did you plug in audio? Uh, we don't need to worry about it. Um, so Word Hunt is an app that you uh, use to go around capturing words. Um, and it takes those words that you've photographed into its library and it uses them to generate a random poem. Um, and to do that, it uses uh, Google's Cloud Vision API to read the words from the images that you've uh, photographed with it. Um, I'll let this play for just another second. Um, and right now it, it composes the words Dada style, which for those of you who don't know, um, was like coined by this Dada artist who said, you're gonna cut up a newspaper article, shake up the bag and um, dump out the words and that's your poem. Um, so sometimes the words arrange themselves into something that's somewhat coherent and kind of charming. Uh, I'm just going to read these poems now. Personal and September, play this friendship. B.S. Margaret, as the undergraduate, 28. Will Otto Profound for Richard, 2001. Were. Here. Um, and sometimes uh, I would have a bug that would generate just blank space. Um, and I found that this kind of formed a pause that was still charming and, and worked within the poem. Um, the first iteration of this app involved you actually going out and capturing words to assemble the poem of someone else. Um, I was pulling from a poetry API to uh, get old poems from old dead people. Um, and you'd go around and fulfill the library of their, their words um, and were rewarded by finishing their poem. Um, and actually I was kind of pushing against doing a generative poem. Um, but uh, Golan in my class introduced me to Alison Parrish's concept uh, and her approach to conceptual poetry which involves sending out um, robots uh, that 
write generative poetry to explore the nonsensical and um, see what they find. Um, so, yeah, that's my poetry, yeah. General flavored naturally. General flavored naturally, <laughs> ingredient first, whole grain. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Ling Dong Huang. Huang. Uh, Ling Dong uh, will be speaking about recursive radical packing language and pose estimation playrooms. Ling Dong is an undergraduate uh, senior at Carnegie Mellon University studying uh, in our hybrid uh, computer science and art uh, undergraduate degree. He makes generative and interactive stuff. Ling Dong, take it away. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Ling Dong. Uh, today I'm going to talk about two of my recent projects. Uh, the first is called a Recursive Radical Packing Language. So um, currently, uh, Chinese characters uh, in the computer font are um, encoded as glyphs. So they're more like pictures without information of uh, their structure or uh, what radicals or parts they are composed of. So um, my idea is to uh, encode all this information into a short string that is used to represent each character. And there can be a lot of um, a visualization and uh, interaction based on uh, this method. So first I'm going to briefly introduce how it works. So the building blocks are a short string of numbers from uh, zero to eight, and each of the numbers uh, denote whether a stroke should be drawn on a grid of this shape. So the most, one, most simple ones are like these. Then you can use uh, dashes and bars to uh, combine twos together, uh, like this. And you can use parentheses to group them so, so you can create more complex structures. And you can reference other characters um, to create their combination. So uh, I'm going to show um, a couple of visualizations I'm able to make with uh, this language. So um, first one is uh, an animation of uh, the how uh, characters are combined from radicals. Uh, in this one, you can see the animation as well as uh, explanation and the uh, short string that uh, builds it. Uh, and the second one, um, you can see the uh, so-called family tree of characters. So this is a, a graph showing um, the relationship between all the uh, all five thousand characters I've uh, labeled. So uh, all the little bit bubbles are individual characters, and the lines between them that now looks like a dark cloud is. Uh, the edges between the vertices. So if I move my mouse over the characters, you can see uh, the components of the character. So at the top, uh, the characters are more simple and some of them are just themselves or one or two components. And at the bottom, they are more complex. And I think the most complex one is this one. You can see that there are multiple levels. Um, the last visualization I want to show is um, a particle system where characters disintegrate from one and uh, combine into another. Okay. Uh, and finally, um, I also plug in some uh, machine learning algorithms to create uh, non-existent characters. So most of these don't exist, but does look like Chinese characters. <laughs> so yeah, that's my first project I would like to show. And the second one is called uh, Post Estimation Playrooms. So um, 
in this one, uh, I'm going to do a live demo, so I don't know if the lighting is going to work. So yeah. Uh, in this one, uh, your pose will be tracked in real time. So I'm the little blue guy on the right. And uh, uh, what I do in front of the camera will be uh, what, the, what my avatar will do. So in this uh, interaction or game, uh, you can do various things like walking around and picking up objects just like in real life. And it's online, so uh, other people will be able to see you and play uh, the same games with you. So I'm just going to demo a bit. So yeah, I'm moving around. Uh, I'm going to skip the demo into the next rooms. So in this one, you just pick up boxes and throw them around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it also has uh, voice recognition, so uh, you can see what I'm talking in the bubble. Uh, in this room, it's like a Google Doc, but everyone draw at the same time. In this room, it's a uh, liquid fun uh, fluid simulation. So you play with water, like in a swimming pool. Uh, this room is uh, a c where you can draw custom shapes on the canvas. So what you draw on this canvas will become a real object that you can move around. Oh. You can draw smaller ones or big ones. OK, uh, I think I. And this one is the piano. So uh, There are also other rooms where you can play on this URL. So, yeah. And these are networks where people can play together. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, you can have fun. So. Thanks, Ling Dong. Wonderful. Uh, next up is Sam Nocenzo. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Sam. Uh, Sam will be presenting a talk entitled TSNI Motion Data Sculpture. Uh, Sam Nocenzo is a software developer and artist exploring media of generative design, data visualization, and new media. Sam was involved in digital humanities research at Pitt using processing to visualize the results of facial recognition algorithms used on Bertillon cards. Uh, mentioned in Kyle's talk earlier today. He's interested in projects that explore new forms and perspectives across disciplines and technology. It's my pleasure to welcome Sam Nocenzo. And you're up. All right, so uh, I'm here to talk about a project that I started um, last spring and have been working on kind of on and off since then. And it's a, a TSNE motion data sculpture. And don't worry if you don't know the terms, I'll try to explain them as best as I can. Um, so a little about me first, um, as Golan said, I'm a software developer and artist, and I, um, uh, and I do, and I've been using processing since I was like later in high school and then through college on short sketches and different projects, and then towards the end of college got into open frameworks, uh, and I've always been interested in generative design and uh, finding forms in data and noise and uh, sort of using technology and algorithms to create like a new perspective on sort of uh, usual things. Um, and so this is the project that I'm going to show. Uh, this is a GIF, I hope it, yeah. It's fine. Okay. Um, but yeah, so, uh, wait, I'm not seeing presenter notes. <laughs> Okay, um, oh, here we go. Okay, so uh, so bear with me, I'll explain the terms in a little bit, and, uh, but this is made with open frameworks. I'm using um, uh, a, the OFX uh, TSNE plugin uh, made by Gene Kogan, um, and what it's showing is a data sculpture made by the paths that two word to vec points take through the TSNE algorithm, and um, and it creates uh, this kind of motion with like, uh, it creates a mesh um, between the two paths that these words take. Um, and it was mostly created in the effort of exploring forms and motions created with machine learning word processing. 
and so, uh, all right, so ML4A is like a big resource of machine learning uh, for artist pro projects, and um, and here's a couple of examples right here. Um, and it was really great to see all these projects, and it was really inspiring to um, look at them and sort of figure out how to think about machine learning creatively and utilize them for uh, to find new perspective on these subjects. Um, and so for Word to Vec, uh, this is a little GIF showing sort of what the outcome is. Um, so this is a, so what Word to Vec does is it ingests a corpus of text and outputs all the different words with corresponding vectors, just lists of numbers characterizing the word within the text. And so uh, this vector can allow a computer to see similarity between two words. Um, uh, and so for instance, exploration, discovery, and studies have very similar vectors. So these can be compared together and they're find, found clustered together in this, in this 3D representation. Um, so these word to vec produces these like 100 to two dimensional vectors. So um, TSNE is an algorithm that reduces the dimensions in these vectors down to what is visible to us. So it tries to reproduce these clusters and minimize the error that exists between the two points of a high dimension and uh, low dim lower dimensions. Um, and it runs through this iteratively. So it's like at each point in the iteration, it's trying to minimize the error. So the points will move a little bit and they go through this kind of, uh, or wait, oh, sorry. Um, and they go through this kind of uh, motion that's uh, sort of, it's kind of rhythmic and uh, kind of seems like a dance for these. Oh, the video's not playing, okay. Um, sorry. Uh, Wait, where is? Did you click on? I, okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, so it goes through this kind of uh, motion that's kind of like ocean-like and choreographed, almost like these words are going through a dance to find themselves in this new space. Uh, and they're trying to recreate the clusters of where they belong from the higher dimensions down to three dimensions um, so that we are able to sort of comprehend to some degree, how the computer is finding these words similar. And so this also was inspired by a project by Memo Acton and Quayola, and this is a um, motion, motion sculpture from, taken from the movement of a dancer, and it uh, uses this rendering to create these sculptures from the movement and this like permanent thing through time. Um, and so I took these two ideas and wanted to make this kind of, uh, the same kind of sculpture from the motion that these words take through this algorithm. And so I'll hopefully be able to demo this okay. Let me find my mouse. <clears throat> Give me one sec. Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. <clears throat> okay. So these are, or, let me, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so these are the points um, in the machine learning algorithm uh, the words. It's a sample of the points in the algorithm and they're used, you saw them moving around and that's them going through the algorithm, uh, TSNE. And then I have a sculpture made uh, around two of the points traveling through this algorithm. And so the idea is to, uh, and this is still like a work in progress, so I don't really have things to show what the words um, are and it's a small sample. But to be able to like type in two words that are meaningful to you and to have this kind of 3D embodiment of the translation of how a computer would think about it to the clusters that we can see and relate to. Um, and to have a 3D embodiment of that uh, was really cool to explore. And this is like an exploratory project just to see um, what kinds of forms can come out of things like this. Um, but yeah, the project is on GitHub and uh, Thanks for, thanks for watching.
Thanks, Sam. Our last presentation of the uh, Lightning Talks afternoon is Jocelyn McDonald, who will be giving a presentation entitled Digits. Here she comes. Jocelyn is an artist, designer, and technologist. She first began building technology systems on the Navajo Nation. She attended Parsons, the New School for Design, and co-founded a circuit-based education company. Later, she attended CMU and developed humor, play, and identity-based frameworks to inform the design of physical and digital technologies. Presently, she's the founder of Digital Culture Club, an organization that helps, make, helps good people make better things. Hi, everybody. Thank you for the introduction, Golan. So I'm going to talk to you guys today about a new project that I've been working on. It's about desired interface. Sorry, I have a cough. It's about desired interfaces and thinking about how we might start asking for what we want from the future of interfaces. And I'll show you today some artificial nail technology prototypes that demonstrate my personal longing for more humorous, playful, and feminine forward technology. So why should we be interested in the future of interfaces and interactions? With 5G networks around the corner, the Internet of Things can actually become viable. And what's most likely going to occur, and has almost always occurred previously, is that designers of the Internet of Things technologies are going to take present technology interactions and those paradigms, which generally have been built upon um, workplace optimization paradigms, and they're going to replicate them in these new systems. So further locking us, in my opinion, into rote, boring, often inexpressive modes of interaction. So I'm asking that we take a moment before 5G Internet of Things and we start asking ourselves what would we like to consider in future design interaction frameworks and paradigms. So in my own work, I often think about humor, play, and forwarding the feminine as design frameworks and constraints to generate concepts for interaction design strategies. And I came up with digits, acrylic nail interfaces of the future. And I'm going to present a few of those prototypes here. This is uh, new work, and you guys are the first audience for this, so I'm really excited to show it to you. All right, so without further ado, here's my first prototype. This is Giant Welcome Eagle Advantage Nail. Your advantage card to begin your transaction. Your Giant Eagle Advantage card has been accepted. <laughs> it was accepted, but I made a cheesy face, so I cut it out. Um, this is the Giant Eagle Advantage card nail, an acrylic nail embedded with my Giant Eagle Advantage card barcode for easy, sleek checkout from Pittsburgh's premier grocer. <laughs> Gone are the days of digging through your bag for that pesky card. All right, next. Here's my QR code nail. This one opens up my Digits website, but you can make one that links to your phone number or your Facebook profile if you're feeling flirty, uh, or change.org petition <laughs> if you're getting involved. Whatever you want, it's the future, and it's fun forward and fun, playful. All right, this is the back it up nail that my presentation is on. <laughs> <laughs> Popped it off and put it in there. Yeah, just keep your files ready to go. You never know when you're going to give a lightning talk. So, um, yeah. That might be my favorite. Oh, sorry, and I didn't mention there's a... Oh, wait, wait. There's a little gem on there for flare. If you can see it on the chip. Okay. Next, we have the swipe right nail. Featuring my Amex <laughs> uh, <laughs> that also functions as an ice scraper. <laughs> and also the card is expired, so it's better as an ice scraper at this <laughs> But my vending machine did accept it, so I was like, hacked. All right. Next, I have my oh, I can't find LED. Put a little coin cell in there. Oh, there you go. There your keys are in your bag. Hat. Uh. <laughs> okay, we have the stylish stylus. Little capacitive, conductive material on the tip of an acrylic nail. 
let you doodle on your cute dog. Done. These have gemstones also for style and flair. And it lets you highlight required reading if you do research, which is important to stay on task. But do whatever you want with your stylus. I'm not going to tell you what to do with it. OK, next. Last but not least. This is a bus pass nail set. <laughs> that worked. That worked. Last night, it worked. <laughs> After many versions did not work. <laughs> Actually, we just I just like cut a lot of the cables on accident. But anyway, yeah, I soaked my connect card and acetone, pulled the RFID chip out, made an acrylic nail set out of it because, and this was the idea that launched me to do the whole series, I feel like I'm constantly digging for my stuff and I would love to have an interaction and interface that's playful using the acrylic nails that allows me to just boop onto the bus and be done and make my life easier and more fun and demonstrative and playful. So I'm glad we got to pull off a set for last night and uh, yeah, I'm really excited to share these prototypes with you and I would love to talk to you more about this work. So feel free to reach out and I'll be here after the talks. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Oh, and I want a big thanks to Owen Daly, my partner who helped me a ton with execution. Thanks. Thank you.